newer attorneys is there are cases in which um, there are uh, good facts but maybe not so good of a lawyer. And then there are cases with uh, bad facts but a very good lawyer. And the ultimate result is not going to just be about the facts or just be about the advocacy, but some amalgamum of those. And that um, way to look at trials I think is as important because uh, lawyers, especially zealous advocates on behalf of certain clients, will get very wedded to their, their, uh, uh, their cases that they're pleading. And it's important for them to understand they're doing their best to make the presentation of evidence. The best trials that I had, the judge could meld into the background. And the two, the lawyers, the various attorneys, whether it be two parties or more, uh, did an excellent job of, of presenting that case to the fact finder, whether it be the, the judge or the jury. So truly what John Roberts said, you, yes. being able to just kind of step back. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, I, I think, some of the observations I had. Were there difficulties with regard to certain advocacy? Absolutely. Um, uh, those, I've always looked at those difficulties as um, an, uh, an opportunity to have us all revisit the ideal of what an advocate should be. And that's a very difficult process. Uh, what is the ideal? Is it your fathers who are attorneys? Is it an employer that you have? Is it a judge that you admire? Is it a, a, another public servant? And that kind of revisiting of the ideal that can happen in a really good trial is something that um, I think everyone should aspire to, especially in this kind of a, a milieu of the, of the law school. I remember, especially kind of more earlier in my time on the bench, um, making a comment to lawyers who had really done a good job and saying to them, I'm glad those newer attorneys were in the back of the room and they saw what you did because this is how they learn. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is how they uh, get to uh, try to approach that idea. You raised a lot of interesting points and we'll delve into those in a bit more depth in a moment, but I'll give you a chance, uh, John Frank. Yeah, what did you see when you looked out? from your bench. You, you pose the question in terms of being in trial mm -hmm. or being in court mm -hmm. or being in front of a jury, and I guess I have, I have different thoughts about lawyering in, in that setting as opposed to a lot of the other lawyering you, you see in terms of uh, briefs to the court and, and other types of appearances and, and motion practice. But uh, in court, of course, we, we see, saw a, a wide range of talent and ability. and. Uh, Often lawyers would ask for comments or advice after a trial, and I, I tried to learn to, to be positive because it's very easy to be a critic. Uh, jurors are a great example. They, they are so critical of lawyers when a trial is over, and I often find myself when I was talking to jurors to, I, explaining that it's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> and uh, I would always try to find something that an attorney did well mm -hmm. to, in order to say, you did that well. That was good. That was a good thing. Uh, but it, it's easy to be a critic, so I, I, I will be. In, in terms of in court, I think the thing that it's missed perhaps most often uh, is the, the teaching function of the lawyer with respect to the jury or in other settings, uh, perhaps the, the judge. And, and getting lost in the words that go along with the case and not finding a way to explain the case to the jury, particularly with, with visual aids. I'm not just talking about the technology that's available now with PowerPoint to come in and, and put on a, a good show. Sometimes it's, it's too good of a show. I'm talking about very simple ways to explain your points and, and, and teach a jury. I, I sometimes compare it to, uh, I, I talk to lawyers about if, if you took a course from a professor and for the entire course all they did was speak to you. Never wrote on the blackboard, never had a picture or a diagram or an exhibit, just spoke words uh, for the entire course. Would that be an interesting course? Would you learn much? And the answer is usually no. And I, I think lawyers need to spend much more time stepping back and saying, how does this look to the person I'm trying to convince? What does this whole thing look like from the jury box or, or from the bench? And how can I teach uh, about this? You said uh, uh, something interesting to me the other day when we spoke on the phone. You said that uh, good lawyers, it surprised you to some extent, that good lawyers were not necessarily good in front of a jury. How so? I think I, I saw this more in the civil arena than in, in the criminal arena, and it's pretty logical because in the criminal arena, lawyers often get lots of trial experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I grew up in the federal system and, and didn't get a lot of trials. I tended to have long, complex trials, but I... I 
I didn't have a lot of trials, and I came to the state system and watched lawyers who just tried case after case, which was good in some ways and bad for them in, in other ways, perhaps. But they had lots uh, of experience. In the civil world, uh, trials are fewer and f uh, they're, they're farther between, and uh, often you'll have lawyers who've been civil lawyers for quite a while but have very little experience in the courtroom. And so I, I observed lawyers who I thought were really terrific uh, and were really terrific, uh, but suddenly in the uh, setting of the courtroom, particularly a jury trial, they weren't so terrific anymore, and a lot of it was just experience. Mm -hmm. Did you see that too, Mike? I did. Um, it began very early on, because my first job out of law school was uh, clerking for a federal judge, and a lot of the advocacy that you saw there was written advocacy, and you thought, wait a minute, uh, we had spent an entire semester on a brief in law school, and then you're reading the briefs and you're thinking, this is big disconnect. Cases are not being found. Arguments are not being made. And then you realize the, the whole spectrum of both written and oral advocacy that you're going to see. And with uh, lawyers, words are their tools. And notwithstanding visual aids that I think are very important, um, you're going to use those words either orally or you're going to use them in writing. And people learn different ways. They learn visually. They learn orally. Uh, and you've got to be able to persuade. You've got to use that, your rhetorical skills to do that. And that's why, as a lawyer, you really have to make, uh, go for that goal of being an excellent written advocate, but also an excellent oral advocate. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about good lawyering. Uh, but there is a distinction to be made, is there not, between good lawyering and results. The facts do ultimately determine cases, don't they? The facts and the law, I would like to <laughs> include both. And I sometimes compare it to playing a bridge, uh, a hand of bridge. You can be the world's greatest bridge player. You, you're, you're not going to win every hand. You've you, you got to play with the cards you're, you're dealt with. And a good bridge player knows how to use those cards to his or her advantage, uh, make the bids that are going to increase the likelihood of success. Uh, but you don't know necessarily where the queen of clubs is sitting. And, and, and ultimately, you're going to lose some cases no matter how good you are. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so certainly the, the facts and, and the law are important, but uh, legal talent plays a big role in that result. And further to that, right now, in this moment, lawyers from our firm, Gas Weber, are trying a very lengthy case in Montana against Jerry Spence. Mm -hmm. He's very famous for mm -hmm. I've never lost a jury trial. Well, I think one of the responses is to say, if you've never lost a jury trial, have you tried all the cases you have to try for exactly that reason? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I want to have you uh, both uh, touch on the, uh, the subject of advocacy and, and, and the proper role of an advocate. Um, has the definition of what is uh, permissible as an advocate changed over time? Have you seen a change uh, in, in your experiences in the courtroom over time? I'll begin with you, John. There was a lot of talk perhaps five, ten years ago or more about decorum in the courtroom and concerns about the decline in decorum. I had a little trouble with that because I didn't feel I was seeing that. I, I didn't uh, see uh, a change. Uh, of course, there are lawyers who don't act as they should in court. But by and large, I thought uh, lawyers did a pretty good job of maintaining decorum and understanding the role of the advocate. Uh, lawyers. Uh, it's important, and I often would think this when things would tend to get out of hand, that lawyers have to understand that their job is not to be as angry and emotional about the case as, as the client. Uh, they need to understand their client's position, but they don't need to ad adopt that attitude and assume the worst from uh, opposing counsel. Uh, their role as, as advocate is to be the thoughtful, responsible person dealing with the issues and guide the client uh, through and, and attorneys can often, for a variety of reasons, ad adopt the emotions uh, of the case in, in a way that's uh, not productive. But by and large, I think uh, lawyers understand that role and they perform that role. And when they, they don't, it's not that hard to bring them back on track. The most important thing, I think, is simply not to let them talk at each other. You know, if you're in court,